end of the series on relationships. And normally, I think originally today was going to be the last day, but we're actually going to take one more week um, and finish it up next week as we deal with the self um, specifically. But today we're talking about friendships, and um, we've been talking for the last month or so around how to create healthy relationships based upon um, the things that, that the Bible teaches us. Amen. So we're dealing with friendship today, and so we have video, of course, to introduce the sermon. So let's turn your attention back to the sermon. It's not exactly the partner you'd expect a primate to fall for, but an unusual love story has been forced between Surya, the six-year-old orangutan, and a stray hound dog named Roscoe. For these logic-defying friends, it's all hugs and cuddles since the day they met three years ago when Surya spotted the dog from high atop an elephant while on a ride with his trainers at this South Carolina animal park. To me, they seem like long-lost friends. You know, they would make you believe in reincarnation. Unusual, yet one of many puzzling partnerships uncovered by National Geographic. They found animal alliances in the wild that test boundaries, go against nature, and redefine love. This pairing, researchers say, is one of the strangest animal bonds ever seen. A lioness who, instead of eating her dinner, adopts it. I think many people felt that this was, you know, had to be a message from God. Um, this was a miracle. This was, you know, the lion and the lamb laying down together. In this case, that lamb was an antelope calf, the last creature you'd ever expect to curl up next to one of the most ferocious hunters in the wild. Why would that lioness defy her instinct to kill? What we think happened was that she actually went through quite a traumatic loss, very sudden traumatic loss. And this clicked a switch in her head that, that just sparked this obsessive compulsive behavior. So that when she came across this baby oryx, instead of seeing food, she saw baby. This other, more whimsical partnership between predator and prey has been seen on YouTube some five million times. A cat and a bird that shouldn't get along playing hide and seek, even wrestling. We were sitting outside, one of us said, oh my God, what is that thing over coming down the, in the street? She said, oh my God, it's a cat. What, what's that with a cat? A black crow two of nature's enemies frolicking like fast friends. From the hippo and the tortoise who sidle up next to each other, so many of these relationships are hard to explain. I don't really want to say it's a very primeval, basic thing. You know, it's a bit more sophisticated than that. You know, I mean, maybe love is primeval. I mean, I think maybe love is something that's transcended that. Animal behavioralists say, despite their differences, nature's unlikeliest companions pair up because for whatever reason, they fulfill each other's needs, whether emotional or practical. For me, as someone who's watched the natural world and who thinks in evolutionary terms, the big message I get out of it is cooperating works. Being social works. And what could be more social than an orangutan sharing a leisurely swim with a hound dog? It is nature's way of showing us friendships truly know no boundaries. Hey Amen. Friendships know no boundaries. That's a pretty bold statement, huh? <laughs> yeah, okay, y'all quiet this morning. <laughs> All right, so let's get into the scripture. <laughs> if you have your Bibles, let's turn to the book of Ruth. If you have the um, Bible from the church, it's page 210, but it's also going to be up on the screen in a few moments. The book of Ruth is located in the Old Testament. I'm going to look at the first chapter. Ruth chapter 1. I'm going to read from the New Revised Standard Version of the Bible. In the days when the judges ruled, there was a famine in the land, and a certain man of Bethlehem in Judah went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and his wife, the name of his wife was Naomi, and the names of his two sons, Malan and Chilion. They were Ephraimites from Bethlehem in Judah. They went into the country of Moab and remained there. But Elimelech, the husband of Naomi, died, and she was left with her two sons. These took Moabite, these took Moabite wives. The names of one was Orpah, 
and the name of the other Ruth. When they had lived there about 10 years, both Milan and Chilion also died, so that the woman was left without her two sons and her husband. Then she started to return with her daughters-in-law from the country of Moab, for she had heard in the country of Moab that the Lord had considered his people and given them food. So she set out from the place where she had been living, she and her two daughters-in-law, and they went on their way to go back to the land of Judah. But Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go back, each of you, to your mother's house. May the Lord deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. The Lord grant that you may find security, each of you, in the house of your husband. Then she kissed them, and they wept aloud. They said to her, No, we will return with you to your people. But Naomi said, Turn back, my daughters. Why will you go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may become your husbands? Turn back, my daughters, go your way, for I am too old to have a husband. Even if I thought there was hope for me, even if I should have a husband tonight and bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from marrying? No, my daughters, it has been far more bitter for me than for you, because the hand of the Lord has turned against me. Then they wept aloud again. Orpah kissed her mother-in-law, but Ruth clung to her. So she said, See, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her gods. Return after your sister-in-law. But Ruth says, Do not press me to leave you or to turn back from following you. Where you go, I will go. Where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people and your God my God. Where you die, I will die. There will I be buried. May the Lord do thus and so to me and more as well, if even death parts from me from you, parts me from you. When Naomi saw that she was determined to go with her, she said no more to her. So the two of them went on until they came to Bethlehem. And when they came to Bethlehem, the whole town was stirred because of them. And the women said, is this Naomi? She said to them, call me no longer Naomi, call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt bitterly with me. I went away full, but the Lord has brought me back empty. Why call me Naomi when the Lord has dealt harshly with me and the Almighty has brought calamity upon me? So Naomi turned together with Ruth the Moabite, her daughter-in-law, who came back with her from the country of Moab. They came to Bethlehem at the beginning of the barley harvest. This is the word of God for us, the people of God. And we say thanks be to God. Amen. Finding friendships. Finding friendships. Let's bow for a word of prayer. God, we are so incredibly thankful for this moment, and we ask that in your grace and in your mercy, that you silence any voice within us but your own. God, help us to fully hear and receive you. God, such that we will not take this as we take so many moments of our week, receiving information, processing information, and then allowing that information to leave. But God, allow what we glean from you to be a very meaningful experience that adds to our relationship with you and others in a way that makes it better and more like what you created us to be. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Amen, amen. finding friendships. The scholar and theologian, he's also a caretaker, Henry Nowen wrote this once about friendship. When we honestly ask ourselves which person in our lives means the most to us, we often find that it is those who, instead of giving advice, solutions, or cures, have chosen rather to share our pain and touch our wounds with a warm and tender hand, the friend who can be silent with us in a moment of despair or confusion, who can stay with us in an hour of grief and bereavement, who can tolerate not knowing, not curing, not healing, and face with us the reality of our powerlessness. That is a friend. Who cares? As we look at our account today, we see a family. And this family is living in Bethlehem, which later becomes the birthplace of Jesus. But there's a famine in Bethlehem, and they are torn away from Bethlehem, and they move to Moab. And so Elimelech is the husband, and Naomi is the wife, and they have two sons. And once they get to Moab, which is a place that 
Some people say it has Jewish roots because of Lot, but at any rate, there are often a lot of dissension between the Moabites and the Jewish people. So they get into this foreign land, and when they get there, Elimelech dies. And so Naomi is left with her sons, who then marry two Moabite women, Orpah and Ruth. And they seem okay for about 10 years or so, until then both of her sons die. So now Naomi finds herself in a foreign land without any blood relation, and she's in a very dark and heavy place. Now some of us, among us, may know the gut-wrenching pain of losing a child. And there may be some among us who knows how bad it feels to, leave, to lose a beloved spouse. But I imagine if there are any among us, it is just one or two who may know how it feels to lose both a beloved spouse and every one of your children. She was in a dark and despairing place. What is she to do? She don't have any family here other than these two daughters-in-laws. And so she says to them, okay, I've heard that the famine has been lifted. God has shown favor in Bethlehem again. We're going to go home. But then she realizes, I don't have anything to give to these two women. I don't have sons for them to marry, and this is how women were stable during this time. What can I offer them? I can't offer them anything. So you know what? They need to go back to their homes. And so she says to Orpah and Ruth, look, I'm going back to Bethlehem, but I don't have anything to offer you there. Like, you have, you have dealt well with me, but I just, I can't give you anything. You need to go back to your mother's house. And may God bless you with marriages, and may he bless you according to how you have been with me and how you have been with the people that I loved, even in the midst of death. And immediately these two girls just begin to weep and cry and fall apart. They say, no, no, we want to go with you. She says, why do you want to go with me? She's like, really? I'm too old to get married again? She says, and even if I could have kids, are you going to wait till they get big enough to marry them? No. She says, go back to your mom's house. And so Orpah, in tears, kisses her and goes back home. But Ruth clings to her. She says, oh, come on, Ruth. Look, Orpah has gone back. Follow her. Do that. That is what is best for you. And Ruth says to her, she says, do not say to me to stop following you. Don't tell me to not go with you. Why? Because where you go, I will go. Where you sleep at night, I will sleep. The God that you serve, I will serve. Your people will be my people. Where you are buried, I want to be buried. And even if death separates us, I still want our experiences to be connected. Mm -hmm. Naomi realizing that she's not going to convince Ruth to not go. So she simply doesn't try anymore. And they make this journey to Bethlehem. And when they get there, just like most small towns, there's a stir. Naomi's back. And so the women, is this Naomi? It's been years since I've seen Naomi, but so much has changed in Naomi's life. She has seen so much pain. It changes you. And so they call her by her name, Naomi, but her name means my joy. And she says, no, that's not my name. My name is Marl, which means bitter. Because God has dealt bitterly. She's in a bad place, y'all. And so they stay there, and they build a life there. If you haven't read the entire book of Ruth, we'll allude to some of it in the coming minutes, but take the time to do that. Read through the entire book. It's very short books, like three, four chapters, somewhere like But as we look at this passage, we find that there is something about friendships that this passage tells us some very deep stuff about friendships. One of the things we see in this passage is that good friends are always family, even when family may not necessarily be friends in the same way, right? A friend is a person who is an ally, an advocate, a supporter, someone we are fond of, but also someone who knows us really well. And what we see in the dynamic of Naomi and both of her daughters-in-law is that Something was happening between their relationship that made both of these women rather stay with her than go back to their original families. 
Now, I don't know. There could have been any number of things, one of which, you know, there is a strong bond around life experiences, especially when there's grief and pain that's involved. But either way, something had been cultivated there that made them not just be friends, but this friendship was so strong that they were family. She calls them daughters. But I believe that there are a few things in this passage that we need to pay attention to because good, wholesome friendships are hard to come by. And sustaining them is even harder if we don't have the proper perspective. And so I believe that there are about four things in this passage that focus on that can give us a better perspective around healthy friendships and how God has given, given friendships to us as a blessing. The first thing that I think this passage points out that we need to pay attention to is this kiss versus cling. This idea that there are some friendships that are meant to last a lifetime and there are some that are only for a season. Some are meant to last a lifetime and then there's some that are only for a season. Can't tell you how many times I've talked to college students after a year or two of school, right? They go back home, they're around their friends from back home, and either their friends went to another school or they're doing something completely different with their life, and they keep expressing really grief around this idea that their friends say that they've changed and they don't feel as close to them, they don't feel this connection. And what I usually say to them really surprises them because I say, you know, an experience of higher education is designed to make you think differently, make your decisions differently, and act differently. And so if you aren't changing, you are wasting your money. Right? right? There are relationships that are only for a season because there are life changes that happen that shift. And that doesn't mean that the people who are in our lives right now for this season that aren't meaningful and that we don't love them. It just means that something has shifted and that time of support with this person has now ended. Orpha kisses her mother-in-law. When she goes back home, she doesn't stop loving Naomi. She probably grieves that loss. But how, do we, how are we able to recognize when some relationships are only for a season and be able to be okay and accept what that gave to us and what we gave to that person in that moment? and move forward. There are even relationships that are seasonal because of our life changes. So for example, developmental life stages have different friends. My friends that I grew up playing with when I was a real little kid aren't the same friends I had when I was in high school. Sometimes things happen in your life. Grief, experiences, certain experiences that connect you to certain people for this season in your life. Geography, I mean, if you're not living close to people, it shifts some things. When I became a mother, that marked for me a very long-lasting relationship and some very brief relationships. I will always be a mother for the rest of my life. That's never gonna change, right? Once I have given birth, it's done. But once I've connected to someone I consider to be my child, it's done. And hopefully one day, as she gets older and becomes an adult, I will be able to be friends with her as I am with my mother now. But when I got pregnant with Kyle, and when Dedrick and I um, brought her home, we both had relationships with people that we no longer had the time to cultivate. Mm -hmm. And many times the people that we didn't connect with a whole lot more were people who didn't have children. So they were kids, people who either their lives didn't accommodate children or they didn't have a tolerance for children. And it doesn't mean that I don't love them and that I don't connect with them every once in a while, but who we were in that moment before, before I had my kid is not the same. It changed, it shifted. But then there are relationships that are very long lasting, that last a lifetime. And these are the relationships that you dig deep into. These are the relationships that no matter what changes happen in either person's life, you are willing to press through. You're willing to be present with their pain. You're willing to, to go the extra mile. And the reason these kinds of relationships are so far and few between is because they take so much work that you cannot exert that energy into four and five and six and seven people. You just can't do it and, and make it really wholesome. Let's be real. It can be exhausting. So when the elders and the mothers say, yeah, baby, some people are your friends, but some people, most people just show acquaintances. Right. <laughs> right? Because you cannot, you don't have the time to invest in what a really deep kind of intimate friendship 
looks like with a whole lot of people. You just can't. Not with everything else going on. So some are meant to be temporal or seasonal, and others are meant to be very long-lasting. So the question for us becomes, who in our life are we holding on to because we missed a shift or a change and we were only supposed to be this close to them for a season? Mm -hmm. Another question you may want to ask is, who in my life have I let go of when I should have been trying to remain there for? Did I let go or give up on some friendships that were really intended to be longer lasting? Mm -hmm. I think this is worth our time and our reflection. And you may not want to reflect by yourself. If you don't journal, then you may need to reflect with someone, someone who's discipling you or mentoring you, or you want to go to a live group or connect to a live group, or whatever you want to, you want to begin to, to really reflect on these kinds of questions. Second, the second thing we see in this, time, this text is that sometimes we miss the opportunity for real friendship because of our own biased boxes. Our own biased boxes. Ruth and Naomi were very different women. By all accounts, they should not have been friends. There was a huge age difference. There was an ethnic difference. There was a difference in religion. There was a difference in family background. All of these differences would say to us, just like all those animals we saw in the video, these two people should not be friends and definitely should not be friends that are this close. And yet they are. And I wonder how many times we are drawn or could have a very blessed relationship with someone very different from us. But we don't because we are more threatened by those differences than we are in terms of connecting around the similarities. We're often threatened by the differences in other people. There's a story about this little red lighthouse that's set on the Hudson River and the story goes that this little red lighthouse was so proud. At night, he would flash his light, warning, warning, turn, flash, turn to the ships on the river to let them know that danger was close, the rocks and the shore. And sometimes fog would fall very heavy, and then he would have two voices. He would have his light, and he would also have his horn screaming, danger, danger, beware. And so he was very proud. He says, what would the ships do without me? But then one day men came and they began to build this huge structure. And day by day, week by week, month by month, eventually this huge gray bridge spanned the width of the Hudson River. And he looked up one night at that great, great bridge. And he saw at the highest peak of that bridge a huge light, a light two and three times larger than his light. Turn, flash, turn. And he felt small and insignificant. So he didn't shine his light. He didn't blow his horn. But a storm came over the river that night. And there was a tugboat, tug, tugging along down the river. And he looked and he squinted looking for the light of the lighthouse. And he couldn't see it. And he listened for the horn and he couldn't hear it and he crashed into the shore on the rocks and lay demolished. And so the great great bridge called down to the little red lighthouse and he says, little brother, little brother, where is your light? And the little red lighthouse says, am I a brother of yours? Your light is so big and mine was so small, I thought mine wasn't needed anymore. He says, no brother. He says, I call to the ships of the air, but you are still the master of the sea. How often do we make comparison about differences with people who God may be blessing us to be our friend? And we are threatened by those differences before we even get a chance to have a conversation with them. Have you ever noticed that even in the friendships and in the relationships that you're in now, your greatest point of frustration is really that point at which their weakness is intended to strengthen you, right? Or your strengths are intended to strengthen their weakness, just as their strengths are intended to strengthen your weakness. Those are a lot of times where those points of frustration really come up. So, for example, if I am obsessed with punctuality, then that means I am destined to be a friend with somebody who is excessively late and tardy. Mm. <laughs> Why? Because they are supposed to 
teach me how to calm down and slow down a little bit, and I'm supposed to teach them how to do the pimping their stuff. <laughs> a really good friend of mine considers his wife to be his best friend, and he says it took them 20 years to work through their issues with finance. He said there were points in which he just was like, mm, I don't know if this is going to work. 20 years before they realized that her being frugal meant that that's what kept them from spending all their money. And him being free to spend is what kept her from, um, from always being bored and being able to have some fun from time to time. There was this balance, right? So what does it mean to look at the greatest points of difficulty and frustrations in your friendships and your relationships as maybe that place either where you are to help your friend grow or they are supposed to be helping you grow? It makes a very big difference in how you look at this stuff, how they complement each other. But these differences that we often overlook or we often shy away from sometimes can be keeping us from a blessing of a very good friendship. So look at your own friendships. Where are those points of frustration that you've been overlooking? But also, who are the people in your life that you consider so different from you that you see pretty regularly? And consider what it may look like to extend an invitation to them to go to call and go to lunch. May not materialize into a friendship, but the question is, how am I pushing myself to be open to any friendship God may be bringing my life? Sir? Third thing we see in this text is that friendships are a conduit of God's grace. Friendships are conduits of God's grace. So what we see with Naomi and Ruth is that it wasn't just mutual um, benefit. There was a mutual benefit, but there was also mutual salvation. But this mutual salvation and this mutual benefit wasn't something that was always steady in their relationship. It often worked in a pendulum. Mm -hmm. So here we have for 10 years, probably Naomi building this relationship with her daughters-in-law. But now she hits this really bad place and the pendulum swings and here is Ruth saying, I'm going to support you in a way that I know you can't return to me right now. Right? And then it swings back. Later, Naomi helps her find a husband, right? Later, Naomi, Naomi is the one, it's her relationship with Naomi that actually allows her to come into relationship with God. She says, your God will be my God. Or to return to her little God, right? So this, there's this give and this take. So what we see in this passage that's always looming are these opposites. This give is giving and receiving. It is this empty. Right? And this being full. There is this famine and there is this harvest. Did you notice that she left her home in despair? Naomi left Bethlehem in despair of this famine. And she returned because of the despair of loss. But when she returned, she was returning to the harvest. So there's this dichotomy that is happening. Right? This back and this forth. It doesn't always happen in relationships where everybody gives it to everybody at the same time. It's like paddling a bicycle. When one foot is down, I can't put my other foot down until the other one comes up. Right? Because if I try to push down with both feet, I'm not going anywhere. There's this giving and this taking, this pushing. Right? This feeling and this emptying. It is back. It is forth. And that is the grace of God working, saying, when you need, I give. When you need, I give. There's this rhythm that kind of takes place. But we often think that everything's supposed to be smooth and even key all the time. It just doesn't happen. Everybody's in different places in their life. So there has to be this, this kind of rhythm that's happening. One of the ways that I, I remember as a child seeing this happen the most was in this movie, 1989, by Richard, um, starring Richard Pryor and Gene Wilder called Hear No Evil, See No Evil. Yup, my mama and used to watch it. We used to watch it. It's so good. So the whole idea is that there was this unlikely friendship that develops between two men who witness a murder. Wally is a black, blind man who hears the murder. And Dave is a deaf, white man who sees the murder. And so this, this experience connects them such that they are running for their life. And throughout the whole movie, what makes it so funny is that they constantly have to cover each other's deficiencies, right? and save each other in different times based upon their strength or their weakness. 
And so it's about this giving and this receiving, but it's a perfect understanding of what it means to be in a relationship and a friendship with someone and to be constantly experiencing the grace of God. That is this full motion, even though it may not seem equal, it balances out because there's this ongoing motion of giving and receiving. We receive healing. We receive salvation through these relationships, these deep kind of friendships. And so the question becomes, when is the last time you sat down and considered, what is my contribution to my friends? How do I really contribute to their life? And what is it that they contribute to my life? And have I shared that? Have I acknowledged that to them? And if you're really bold, sit down with your friends and figure out, is there giving and receiving in this relationship, in this friendship, or is one of us dry to the bone? Now I realize, again, one of those seasonal things, I realize there are times where we are pouring into people for a season because it's a temporal relationship, and they aren't able to give back to us, but we understand that that's the kind of relationship it is. I'm a friend to them, but they aren't able to be a friend to me. But those relationships are usually very seasonal, or they're like this mentor kind of role, right, where you're very clear that that's what's happening. But in your equal friendship, these friendships where you consider somebody to be able to give to you just as you give to them, you need to be asking these questions. When's the last time you asked your friend, how can I be a better friend to you? Have I been a good friend to you? What's their perspective? Have some conversations about why they still stay connected to you. You need to hear what you do that's good too. And they need to hear it. But acknowledge these points of grace in your friendships. Don't ignore them. Acknowledge them for the power that they are. They are God's grace. Last point is that God honors those or honors the devotion of a good friend. He honors the devotion of a good friend. So good friends are those who, who press us when we don't want to be pressed. Who love us when we don't know we need to be loved. They are the ones who may not always get it right, but they keep trying to. Right? And so this is what we see with Naomi and with Ruth. Ruth was giving to Naomi what she needed, even though Naomi did not know that that's what she needed. Pressing her. And even Naomi was saying to her daughters-in-law, even though you don't want to go back to your mom, that's what's best for you. This is what friends do. Friends are not afraid of your pain and they don't run from your pain. These deep-rooted kind of relationships and friendships. But if we look more deeply at the story, what we will find is that both of these women were honored by God by their, because of their devotion and their loyalty to one another. Naomi later is blessed. She receives her full healing after um, Ruth has married her kinsman Boaz and they have a child. And she's holding this child, and she is full of joy. And so what we see here is this woman who is now reclaiming her rightful name as Naomi, my joy. Because of what has happened in this friendship with her and Ruth. And then Ruth is honored because Ruth gives birth to a son named Obed. And Obed is the father of Jesse. And Jesse is the father of King David. And King David's lineage is the one who births our Savior. So what we see now is that her love and her devotion, her loyalty to her friend Naomi, aligns her with the greatest gift known to humanity. It puts her bloodline in the line of Christ. What great honor is that? A Christ who says to us, I no longer call you servant, but I call you my friend. Because what I know about my father, I have shared with you. What does it look like to be friends with a God who says, what I have is yours? And Jesus actually embodies the words of him we now in, that we saw at the beginning of the sermon. He embodies those. Because Jesus doesn't always answer our questions. Because we're not ready to hear answers. But what Jesus says is that I am willing to walk beside you. I'm willing to journey with you and then point the answers out along the way when you're ready to hear them and see them. He said, I'm not afraid of your pain. I will weep with you. I will wait with you. I will sit with you until you are healed. 
I will watch in pain as you mess up and still love you after. That is the friend of a God that is offered to us. And all Jesus is saying is that I have gifted you with the friendships of other humans. Why? Because I want you to be able to be in friendship with me and then offer that friendship to the world. It is in these kinds of friendship people. This is where we are sustained in life. This is where we get hope when there is no hope. This is how we overcome our despair. This is how we are saved. These friendships are holy ground. When's the last time you considered one of your most meaningful friendships to be holy ground? When's the last time you've seen the face of Jesus in the face of your friend? When's the last time you handled them with such care and such appreciation that they could feel how holy you think this connection is? Something to be said about that. Something to be embraced about that. It says that you can see the worst of me and still love me. And I can see the worst of you. It is a gift to have someone say, I ain't going nowhere. And it doesn't have to be 10 and 15 people. I'm just talking about one person. To have one person say, I ain't going nowhere. And even if in this season in your life you don't have one other human being to say that, I am saying to you that Jesus is saying that to you right now. Jesus is saying, I ain't going nowhere. The question is, are we able and willing to let Jesus be our friend? Because that means Jesus is going to be up in our face. It means Jesus is going to want to get into some parts of yourself that you think you hide from him. He said, Jesus is going to go, he's going to want to dig deep. He's going to get intimate with you. And we're going to deal a little bit more with that next week, with self-authenticity. Right? <laughs> but consider whether or not you have rejected Jesus' friendship. And can this moment, can this day be a moment where you say, Jesus, yes, I want to be your friend. I want you to be my friend.